GPT-5 is out and I've spent the last seven days locked in a room, reading every single blog post, watching every video and testing this model to its absolute limits so you don't have to. This is the ultimate guide to GPT-5 and I've distilled it into seven features and settings you need to know to maximize its output and turn you into a power user of this new incredible model. And it will 10x your productivity. Think of GPT-5 as a bit of a DSLR camera. You can leave it on the manual setting and it'll do an okay job. It'll get the photo you kind of want, but sometimes too much light will leak in or it'll be a bit too blurry for your liking. The magic comes when you place it in the manual setting and you actually know how to use all of its features like the ISO, the shutter speed, and so on. Then you will get the exact photo that you want and even more. Same thing applies for GPT-5. Whilst OpenAI have made it a lot more simple to use these new models with, with less models to choose from, there are still some hidden settings and gems that when you know how to use will take the output from pretty good to absolutely amazing and just what you need. If you're new here, my name's Nico. I help business owners and marketing agency owners rank number one on the AI search engines like Google AI overviews, GPT search and perplexity. So we turn traffic into converting leads and customers using AI tools, automations, and SEO strategies that work in 2025, not the ones that used to work in 2015. But let's get stuck with number one. First up is personalities. Your GPT-5 comes with four personalities that you can use. And at first I thought this was a bit of a gimmick, maybe you're thinking that right now, but the more I used it, the more I realized that these are really, really helpful when used correctly. So how do you access these new personalities? It's quite simple. You go to your settings, customize GPT, and now you have a selection here that says, what personality would you like GPT to have? If you click down, you have four personalities plus the default. Now you have cynic, robot, listener, and nerd. Cynic is my personal favorite. It tells you how it is and it doesn't sugarcoat things. It's actually quite snarky, which I love. I don't know what that says about my personality, but regardless, it gives you brutal feedback on your copy and it just tells it how it is. And sometimes honestly makes me giggle, which is a nice change when I'm using ChatGPT. That is my go-to now. And I think it is incredible at fixing content copy or a website structure. It really gives you solid feedback. Number two is the robot. This is for people that, that just want the answers and no additional fluff. It's kind of emotionless and it doesn't waste any processing power. It doesn't give you the old, yeah, that's a great idea. Let me draft that up for you. Nope. It just gives you the draft. So if you don't like the fluff that GPT starts with, that's your go-to. Good for coding and good for getting straight into work. Then we have the listener. And as it says here, it's thoughtful and supportive. If you're trying to have a bit more of an emotional engagement conversation with GPT, which is a weird sentence to say, but anyway, that is your one to go to. I don't personally like it too much for work, but maybe on the weekends when you're working on a bit of a side project, or if you genuinely like having conversations with ChatGPT, that will make it sound a lot more thoughtful and actually think about the thoughts that you're having. It's warm, it's reflective, it's good for voice conversations as well. The final one is the nerd. Exploratory and enthusiastic as it says right here. You can think of this as your cool nerdy friend that is really excited to explain how Dungeons and Dragons works and it wants you to play this and it just explains it in great detail without leaving a single rock unturned. It's not only great for context, but it also does a really great job of providing you with a lot of potential options moving forward. I think this is a bit of a creative, but really smart personality to play around with. And I promise if you try them all, you'll end up navigating towards one. Like I said, Cynic is my favorite and it's actually really increasing the enjoyment that I'm getting of using ChatGPT. Number two is understanding the dropdown. We now natively have auto, fast, and thinking. Whilst they're pretty self-explanatory, we need to understand that auto has its internal routing system that depending on the complexity of the question or the task that you're asking GPT, will give it to a smart reasoning model or to a smarter model. It's all versions of GPT-5. Some of them just think for a little bit longer. I tend to always use fast unless I'm starting a project or a conversation and I need to think about the whole structure at first. I'll start with thinking. Auto is great, but you need to know that the goal here for OpenAI is to save processing power. So whenever it can, it's probably gonna give you an instant answer. So if you wanna force it to think more of a project that you're working on, definitely try the thinking when it's needed. Apart from that, the fast is great. If you're comparing it to the old models, think of G fast as using GPT-4.0. This is a lot smarter though. And think of thinking as GPT-03 or 01 if you were using those. And this brings me to feature number three, which is the legacy models. Now, OpenAI got a fair bit of backlash when they got rid of all the other legacy models like GPT-4.0, 03, and 04. A lot of people got 
somehow emotionally attached to these models. And I must admit, even myself, so how do you access these models? Well, now the drop down, you have the legacy model selector, but I only have a GPT-40. What if I want to use the other ones? Well, you need to go into your settings. You need to go into the general and you'll see here a selection that says show additional models. I enable that. I give it a few seconds to load. And if I go back to the drop down, you'll see that not only do I have more legacy models, the ones that I'm used to, 4.0.4.1.03, which is my personal favorite, and 4.04 mini, but I've even got another section here that says thinking mini between the fast and thinking, which is thinking mini. It has a quick think about things before it gives you the answer. I also like that for content copywriting. It tends to get my tone better somehow. I'm not sure why, but now you know you have more options available to you. Number four is admittedly a bit of a gimmick, but if you do spend hours on GPT, it's still a nice to have, and that is changing the color of the highlight. As you can see, mine is green. Does it make ChatGPT5 smarter? No. Does it feel like something Apple would announce as a major feature? Absolutely. But I think a small bit of personalization is quite nice when you're using this tool on a daily basis. To change the color or select one, you want to go, you want to, go to settings, and you can pick in general the accent color. If you click on the drop down, you'll have blue, green, yellow, pink, orange, and purple. Take your pick. Pick one, have fun with it, or spend the time doing something more productive. Is it a feature that people with iPhones will love? Absolutely. Should OpenAI maybe have spent that time working on the working on the output of the models? Perhaps, but anyway, here we are. Pick a color, have fun with it. Number five is the incredible updates to the canvas feature. I am genuinely impressed with this one. This is their version of Claude's artifacts and it's almost in competition. Is it as good? I'm not here to debate that. I'm just here to show you this new incredible update to this feature. Now, as always to use it, you can either do the slash and select and make sure it's selected or you can simply select the plus button and select the canvas feature. What can you do here? Well, let's try it out. For example, I can say, code me a Flappy Bird game. And after about 380 lines of code, uh, we have our Flappy Bird game. Let's test it out. And yeah, it's got the same mechanics. I used to suck at this game, but there you go, a functioning game. Now, this is all well and good, but I'm actually using it for a lot more important and useful things. For example, in our community, I review people's website as many times as they want and I provide a customized Loom video. But what I started to do lately is also provide them with this dashboard that summarizes all the fixes they need to create, even with the code that they probably need to add. And all I do is grab the transcript from the Loom video that I give them, paste that into GPT-5 with the Canvas feature and say, hey, turn this into a nice, dashboard report that can go along with a Loom video. And every single time it doesn't have any dramas and it creates a really, really nice dashboard. So the user can look at the video, but also has the document to go along with it so they can follow along and fix their websites. I almost forgot to mention that you can also share these canvas and artifacts really easily. Once you have your artifacts running, you click the share button, you're going to get a link. And the incredible thing here is that you can share with anybody. They don't even have to have a GPT account. I'm in an incognito tab, for example, I paste the link there and it's going to initialize the environment to run the canvas that we have built. Really, really useful to share reports with somebody, share an interactive application, whatever it is that you want. Boom, there you have it. Number six is using GPT-5 in the custom GPTs, which I think are incredibly underrated because you can connect them with outside data. Let me give you an example. I've created a custom GPT for our community that is called the Keyword Sensei. This connects with real-time SEO data from Data for SEO. But now I can use it with GPT-5, which is even a smarter model, which is good. So for example, I want to say, um, do some keyword research around the words using AI for local SEO. That's all I need to do. And the GPT-5 powered now custom GPT will make sure to confirm that it's going to access the data that I've already given it access to. Do some keyword research and come back to this. Now you've got a keyword research component in an absolute second that only gives you some insights, some action checklists and everything else I need to know to do a good SEO strategy. Now, you can see that by default, it was selected on GPT-4. That was the legacy model that I built this custom GPT in. If you've built any GPT models and you want the default model to be GPT-5, you need to go to edit your model. And when you're in the edit settings, 
The recommended model you need to choose is five. If you leave it on the no recommended model, it'll probably choose a cheaper model. We don't want that. We want to leave it in five. And now next time that I update it and I go to my custom GPT, the default will be GPT-5, which is ideally what you want. And finally, number seven is the most important one. If you watch any part of the video, make sure it's this, and that is OpenAI's prompt enhancer. They have kind of sneakily released a prompt enhancer where you paste in your horrible prompt into this section, click optimize, and it'll create a very good one following all the best practices. Let's give it a go. I'm gonna give you some keyword research data. I want you to turn it into a full SEO action plan. I've got my developer message or my very bad prompt. I'm gonna hit optimize. It'll take a few minutes and it'll give me a beautiful detailed prompt back that I can use to GPT. Now, do you have to use this every time you have a conversation with ChatGPT? Absolutely not. But if you're working on something very specific that is really important to you and you just can't seem to get the right output, this is your golden ticket. I can promise you that the output will be vastly better. And already I have a much better, I have a much better prompt. I can request a change and I can go back and forth with it, having a conversation with a tool that understands the best practices when it comes to prompting. Not only that, but on the dropdown, you can use GPT-5, 4.4, 4.1, and 03, meaning it's gonna optimize for all those models. They all have slightly different tendencies in terms of how you need to prompt for them. Where do you access this? Well, I'll leave everything that I've talked about in the links in the video description below, but this isn't in the normal GPT platform. This is on the OpenAI playground. The playground looks a little bit like this. You'll have to create an account and click the link that I provided below and you can use the prompt enhancer. A little bit trickier to access this, but trust me, it'll be worth it if you want to improve the output of GPT-5 or 4.1 or 03, you want to use this enhancer because it uses the best practices that have been published by OpenAI when it comes to prompting their own models. That's it. Now you have these seven features that will genuinely improve the output of GPT-5, turning you into a power user of this new incredible model. Now, the thing is here that all these things separately are fantastic, but what makes this even better is if you join all these features inside your projects feature. I still think this is one of the most underutilized tool ever when it comes to ChatGPT. Thankfully, I've done a video here that shows you how to use the projects feature in an incredible way that will turn it into your custom content copywriter, allowing you to write content that will rank on GPT search for Plexity and Google AR overviews, but also give you high quality traffic that will turn into leads. You wanna go watch that one right now.